You're listening to the QuickBook Reviews podcast. Brighten your day with a book. Hello, my fellow bookworms. This is Philippa from QuickBook Reviews, author interviews and book reviews. How are we all doing today? Oh my goodness, I've got another lurgy. I don't understand why I keep getting ill. Anyway, we're fighting it. It's going to be fine. Let me tell you who I've got coming on, but then I have something. I need I need to get something off my chest. I need to get your view on something. So anyway, what books are we covering today? We are covering The Other Mothers by Catherine Faulkner, and Catherine's coming on to tell us all about that book. We've also got Hold Your Breath by Helen Pfeiffer, and Helen's coming on to tell us about that book. We've got 30 Days of Darkness by Jenny Lund Madsen. Uh, Contacts by Mark Watson and The Premonitions Bureau by Sam Knight. Two of those I listen to on audiobook. So I will talk you through all of that later. But can I just say, right, at our local petrol station, there are on each lane, there are two petrol pumps. And this weekend, I have had it happen. I had to fill up twice. Don't ask. Lots of journeying around. Both times... I pull in, there is no car, there are no cars in the first bay, the first pump. You can tell I'm really mad about this, can't you? There's nothing in the first pump, but you can't get to it because of the other cars in the other lanes. And so there's a car at the pump before that. And the person who has finished putting the petrol in leaves the car there and goes in and pays. So not only can you not get to their pump, you can't get to the pump in front that's empty. And these people, they don't walk at speed. They meander to it, the place to go in. I'm sure they're taking a lot of time to select different things, different nibbles that they're going to purchase, maybe ordering a coffee. Eventually, they wander back out, beckon a family member. Oh, come back in. Come on, everyone. Let's go. And I am there seething. If they could feel the indignant energy, there needs to be some decorum. We need to agree the do's and don'ts of petrol stations. Surely it is the case that if there is a a bay, a slot free in front of you and you're going to pay, you at least move your car forward into that bay so that someone else can get on and get their petrol. Otherwise, 15 minutes you're there waiting for somebody just to choose which Mars bar, whether they're going for a normal Mars bar or a king size Mars bar. It doesn't take 15 minutes. Anyway, there we are. Enough enough about that. The wrath, the indignant, fuming wrath of Philippa. There we are. What's not indignant and what's not full of wrath are these glorious books that we really need to celebrate. And the first one is called The Other Mothers by Catherine Faulkner. Now, I'm sure you've heard of Catherine. She wrote Greenwich Park, which was Waterstone's book of the at least the month, if not longer, and was on lots of people's lists of books that they were reading. Anyway, the blurb on The Other Mothers, her new book, is this. You want to be one of them until you know them. Ex-journalist Tash has been searching for a story to launch her freelance career, but she's also been searching for something else, new friends to help her navigate motherhood. She sees them at her son's new playgroup, the other mothers, the sleek, the sophisticated, the successful, the women she wants to be. And then one day they welcome her into their circle and Tash discovers the kind of life she's always dreamt of. Their elegant London townhouses a far cry from her cramped basement flat and endless bills. They seem to have everything, but they also have their secrets. And it's soon clear that not everyone at the playgroup can be trusted. And let's go to Catherine to read the first few sentences now. North Cornwall Police Station, April 2019. Tash. We meet in a room with no windows, in a town of pebble dash houses, a high street pockmarked with boards and bookmakers' shops. They have taken me inland, to the nearest station, I assume. Here there is no crash of waves, no call of birds, no cheery stripe of blue peeping out from behind rooftops. Excellent. And now we've heard the blurb and the first few sentences. Let's talk to Catherine all about this book. Well, it is my absolute pleasure to welcome to the podcast Catherine Faulkner, whose latest fabulous book is called The Other Mothers. Catherine, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, it's lovely to have you on. Can you start by summarising this book for us? Yeah, absolutely. Um, So The Other Mothers tells the story of Tash, 
who is an ex-journalist trying to relaunch her career as a freelancer after the birth of her son, not least because she needs to fund his childcare place in an exclusive neighbourhood in North London and keep up socially with the other mothers there, who, unlike her, all live in huge, elegant London townhouses in leafy avenues around the park. When a body of a young nanny is found in a local beauty spot and it's written off as an accident, Tash becomes convinced that a murder has been missed and that this is the scoop she's been waiting for. But her investigation soon leads her to the other mothers, who she has befriended at her son's playgroup. And she starts to wonder whether maybe there's another reason they invited her so readily into her their exclusive little clique. And who exactly is investigating who? Very, very good. Now, can you tell us a little bit more about this main character, Tash? Yeah, so Tash is a character who will, I hope, be familiar to readers with young children who are kind of struggling to make everything work. You know, she's a she was a journalist and she struggled to reconcile that job full time with having her young son. So she's trying to carry on her career and keep that side of her identity, but do it in a different way. She also really wants to be a good parent to him. And she's kind of constantly juggling, constantly torn between those two things. She's also sees a lot of wealth around her, I think, as you do in London, and kind of wonders why she and her husband, Tom, who's a doctor, they both work really, really hard, but they live in a small flat. They don't have a big garden for her son, Finn, that they would love. And Tom wants to move out of London and get a bigger house and have a better lifestyle. And she is a real London person and wants to cling on to her kind of identity as a, a, a working journalist. And so there's a lot of, there's a lot going on uh, for her at that at this stage in her life. And She's the sort of person who scrolls on right move a lot, you know. She wants to <laughs> <laughs> she she looks at other people's houses and lifestyles and she is kind of seduced by that. And so when these other glamorous mothers at her son's playgroup invite her to their kind of bougie play dates in their beautiful houses and for coffee at a sort of expensive cafe sort of deli that she can't really afford to frequently drink coffee and eat croissants in she's just so seduced by it all and it's like a little taste of the life she wishes she had she knows she's a smart person who knows it's not important but there is just a part of her that is seduced by that but then at the same time she's she really wants to get to the truth about this story because she's a journalist and she's really dogged about that so the fun of the book really is seeing those two things collide for her and how she kind of navigates those two kind of conflicting sides of herself, I guess. And is it a story that came to you as you were at the sort of school gate or nursery gate? A bit, yeah. I do find, I mean, I'm really fascinated. If, if anyone's read Greenwich Park, my first novel, you'll know I'm kind of really fascinated by the dynamics between women mm. and how pregnancy and having young children also kind of turns all of that into something else as well so it kind of the kind of wrinkles that creates in your interactions with other women and your friendships and and how the kind of vulnerabilities and anxieties of that time those times in your life kind of play into those relationships I find all of that totally fascinating and yeah definitely you know my daughter was at a, a play group in quite a bougie area and I never felt quite I kind of it was a quite a sort of a small number of hours per day that you that she went there and it was so it was really suited to women who didn't have to work basically. <laughs> and so it was a kind of different tribe that I saw that I mean it was they were all lovely but it was really interesting and there was a certain there's just a dynamic isn't there at any at anything like that anything that's a kind of collision of lots of different people who haven't chosen to be friends they've just they're there sort of by accident but also sort of because they've made the same life choices um it's just inter I just think it's interesting so yeah definitely that played into it and also of course my experiences as a journalist you know as a news reporter and investigative journalist so um really the actual I original idea for the book came from an inquest that I actually attended years ago when I was training to be a news reporter uh, where it had been, you know, the record it was recorded as an accidental death, and I was sitting there thinking, no, it's not. I think this person was murdered. And uh, <laughs> but I, I, you know, I I think that what was really interesting about that case was that it was so unclear. The evidence was so unclear, and I kind of asked lots of questions about it because I was like, hang on, hang on, hang on. How do we know what happened here? Um, how do you know that he ingested this substance by accident? How do you know it wasn't poisoned? You know what? Was and they were just like, well, we we don't, you know, and. Um, what was really interesting was talking to lots of coroners and lots of people in the criminal justice system about how a murder could be missed in this way. And they just said, yeah, 100% it could happen because we're underfunded. And also absence of evidence isn't evidence of absence, but you can't prove a negative. Yeah. There's, there has to be a really high bar to, to prove wrongdoing, really, in these sorts of cases. 
And pathology, you know, on silent witness, it seems really exact. You know, you can tell exactly when someone died and exactly what happened. But it's not like that. It's really difficult, especially if a body's been in water, if you, you know, if there's a delay in discovering the body. So all of that was just totally fascinating. And all that kind of uncertainty and all the shades of grey between that have always fascinated me as, as a journalist. And as I went through, you know, my career as a journalist, seeing lots and lots more cases like that, that uncertainty and that element of doubt I just find so interesting. So I, I had fun playing with that as well. So have you got a whole raft of possible story <laughs> ideas from your experiences? I probably have. I mean, being a journalist is the kind of maddest job. And it's just this rich, mad, especially actually when you're kind of a junior journalist, the, if you're kind of like the person who just gets sent everywhere. Like when you're a trainee reporter, you're sort of, you're just sort of cannon fodder, really. You're just kind of like, well... Oh, you know, if there's a, a big news event, they just send you as an extra pair of hands to make, and they have no expectations that you can actually achieve anything, but they just send you along with the <laughs> with the big boys, you know, uh, to see if you can see if you can pull anything out of the bag. And you just and so you end up doing like basic things like door knocking, you know. So say something's happened in one street, you knock all the neighbours and ask, see if any of them are willing to be interviewed about what's happened or about the person who's involved and. You know, sometimes you knock on people's doors and they're just, you know, butt naked or sometimes they shout at you or sometimes they invite you in and you can't you can't actually leave because they just want to talk to you so much about their life. And you just see all of human nature in its mad glory. And then obviously covering courts, you see all, you know, you see the kind of extremes of what can happen when relationships go wrong, when anger, when people are pushed to breaking point and how, you know, lawyers unravel what happened. And to this person who was leading their life, and then this huge thing happened and then all the consequences of that and all the choices they made when they were under these huge amounts of stress and all of that. Yeah. So, I mean, so much has it's been such an inspiration for me, for sure, as a novelist. And you've mentioned Greenwich Park and I wanted to ask that was the Waterstones through of the month. It was your debut. Was it hard then to write book two or had you already started it? Oh, the kind of difficult second album yeah. complex. Yeah, for sure. No, there was a bit of that. With Greenwich Park, it was an idea that I just had one day and I thought this is just a really good idea and I always believed in it. And I had so much fun writing it. I actually wrote it quite quickly, the first draft, although I spent a long time editing it to get it ready, you know, get it good as good as it could be. I, ne I needed an idea that was as strong as that. And it took me a while to kind of work out what the idea was with the other mothers, because I had this strand that was about the murder investigation, but then I had this strand that I really liked about the playgroup mothers. And, and how was the, were the two things going to mesh together? And so that it took a bit, yeah, it took a bit of time to work it out. And I had, I had times where I thought, oh God, is this actually going to work? But probably because I was over, overthinking it because I was worried it wouldn't be as good as Greenwich Park. And I was like, oh, but actually the main challenge, to be honest with you, I, I, once I got going, I knew it was going to work. And actually, I think it's a better book and I'm, I'm really proud of it. The worst thing was lockdown and I had a new baby and a toddler so when I was writing this book, I, I quite often just had a newborn baby just kind of on the floor next to me. <laughs> and then my toddler downstairs and my husband trying to work from home and we couldn't go out anywhere. And I couldn't, you know, I really like quite a, like a sense of place is really important to me. So when I was writing Greenwich Park, I kind of I had my first daughter, but she was a tiny baby. So I was like walking around Greenwich Park loads, kind of like soaking in the atmosphere with my pram and my laptop, you know, really weird. But we, and with the other mothers, I kind of had this plan to do that at Woodbury Wetlands where it's set, which is this amazing beauty spot, but also kind of slightly got a slightly creepy edge to it. Like Greenwich Park, it was a reservoir that they made into a nature reserve. And then it's got all these brand new flats but they demolished a load of social housing to build them so it's all a bit uneasy and interesting because of the dyma dynamics around that and I just wanted to spend hours and hours in that cafe there just soaking that up and seeing the people who live there and I didn't get to do that that was a challenge and the second book is always a challenge and people do say that and so I, I, I had to lean on my agent who just kept telling me look this is a great book you just got to keep going <laughs> And have you started your next one? Is that any easier? Yeah, actually, it has been easier in a way because I, having done it twice, it's not that you don't get to the roadblocks and you don't get to the points where you think, ah, God, like, what am I doing here? This isn't working. You get to those points. And I, but what I now know is that that's inevitable, that that's part of the process, is that you get to this point, you write a load of words, and then you think, oh, hang on, no, 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 <laughs> that character's not quite working or that we need more conflict here or there needs to be more there's not enough at stake there needs to be something else I'm a great believer that the best writing is rewriting and for me the redrafting and redrafting and redrafting that's just but that's another thing with my second book I listened to lots of advice from other people who said just get the draft out write it all down 
get it finished and then you can edit it and that's the best way to write a book and actually for, that might be true for a lot of people but it's not for me and following that advice was really unhelpful to me because I ended up with a first draft that was mad it was about 140,000 words and it didn't make any sense really and it took a huge amount of work to get it get it back to what it should have been and actually my process is to kind of work at it as I go along and now I've learned to trust my process and do it how I instinctively feel that I should do it which is what I did with Greenwich Park because I didn't know any other way to do it so yes from that point of view the third book is easier because I just have learned to tell myself chill out it'll be fine trust your process kind of thing and how do you manage the thrills and the sort of revelations as the book goes on? Oh, that's the the really fun part. And actually kind of the intellectual challenge as well to get those twists in at the right places. And so, but for me, that that actually comes later. If I was thinking about all that, I mean, if you think about a finished book, how complex it is, how all the different constituent parts, you kind of couldn't, you couldn't plan it. I don't think so. Maybe someone could with a spreadsheet, but I don't, I don't think that I could. I think you have to start with something I always start with the characters and the feeling, the atmosphere, the idea and the kind of, I guess, the inciting incident or the first thing. So f- with the other mothers, I guess, at the beginning, I knew that there would be a body where it had been written off as an accident and actually a journalist was going to uncover that there was more to it. But I didn't know how it would end. But then what I then do is go back on it and think, OK, am I hitting like, am I hitting that exciting bit quick enough? And maybe it needs to come after 5,000 words rather than 10,000 words, that first twist where you find something out. And then, yeah, I tend to go back over it and really work on the structure once the kind of essential story is there. Well, we come to the final question, which is the most important one on this podcast. Yes, we've talked about your book and the process and all of that, but this is the real important one. What biscuit was powering the writing of the other mothers? What was your biscuit of choice? You know, I've given this such a lot of thought because biscuits are so important to me. They're a really big part of my life. And I think choosing a favourite one is like choosing a favourite child, you know. I mean, it just depends on the mood. Sometimes, I, I mean, I absolutely love a dark chocolate hobnob. Like, that's a real favourite of mine. Um, I love, and, and what I love about it is I can kid myself it's slightly healthy. I know it's not. You don't have to tell me it's not. But dark chocolate, you know? No, it is. Dark chocolate's healthy. And then you've hobnob bit oaty, little bit oaty. But if I'm being totally honest, I, like, there's just a really special place in my heart for the custard cream. I, yeah, I know. I know. It's sort of wrong, but it's so wrong. It's right. And it's so dunkable. And I could probably eat, you know, if I had a really big hot mug of tea, as I usually do when I'm writing, mm. if I'm really in my, in the zone, you know, I don't want to brag about it, but I could probably get through a pack of custard creams in probably seven minutes. You know, that's that's the person I am when it comes to business. That's great. We haven't had a custard cream. I don't, I don't really? think we've ever Yeah, had it's one, not a popular so... choice. No, but that's good. You, there, there won't oh, be I a fight uh, over over the, the custard creams. That's yeah, a... there's something really comforting about like the vanilla mm. custardy, powdery-ness of it. I don't know. And it's so sweet. And yeah, I love them. Oh, no, that's wonderful. Well, it's just been fantastic to talk to you and to discover more about your latest book, The Other Mothers. Catherine Faulkner, thank you so much. Thank you. It's been lovely. Coming up, one more author interview and more book reviews. And now we need to go on to Hold Your Breath by Helen Pfeiffer. And let me read you the blurb of this one. When Detective Morgan Brooks is called to Lake Thirlmere, Thirlmere, Philippa, can we say that word? To Lake Thirlmere, one frosty night, she's devastated to find the body of a young woman positioned in front of the glistening reservoir. She has ligature marks on her limbs, glue residue on her eyes, and her beautiful face is as cold as ice. Knowing only a dangerous serial killer would arrange a scene so carefully, Morgan is in a race against time to stop them before more innocent lives are lost. The victim is 20-year-old Jasmine Armour, and her mother is distraught to hear that her beautiful daughter is gone, and Morgan's shocked when she learns that Jasmine's father recently committed suicide at the same picturesque spot. The killer must have known the family. Then Morgan receives a terrifying package at the station of an intricate death mask. She immediately recognises Jasmine's long lashes and perfectly plump lips. With the killer taunting her, Morgan knows time is running out and then Morgan gets the heart-shattering call that her friend Emily has been killed. Ligature marks on Emily's arms are identical to Jasmine's. Heartbroken, Morgan knows this isn't the end of the killer's twisted game. But can she track them down? 
before they take another life. Mm. And let's have Helen read us the first few sentences. She strained against the ropes as they worked with their back to her, humming softly. She knew the song, it was an 80s hit that still got played on the radio a lot. Dave liked to listen to some 80s radio station when he worked, but she couldn't remember the title of it. Excellent. And now let's go and talk to Helen all about this marvellous book. Well, it is my absolute pleasure to welcome to the podcast today Helen Pfeiffer, whose latest fabulous book is called Hold Your Breath. Helen, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me, Philippa. I'm really excited to be here. We're excited to talk to you. Can we just start with the real basic question? Can you tell us a little bit about this splendid book? Oh, this splendid book is actually, I'm going to have to check the cover because I'm so rubbish, I forget which one I'm up to. Uh, It's (laughs) book nine (laughs) in the Detective Morgan Brooks series, set in the Lake District in beautiful Cumbria. And what's the story about? This one, again, I'll just refer back to the book because I'm writing that many of them at the same time. I I can't remember what I'm doing. It's it's awful. Um, Detective Morgan Brooks is called to a a body found at the side of Lake Thirlmere and she's devastated to find this young woman with ligature marks around her neck dead in the car where this young lady's father committed suicide six months previous. So... And that there begins the investigation. <laughs> and what gave you the idea for this particular story? I'm going to be honest. I'm going to say Pinterest. <laughs> I'm obsessed. <laughs> I'm obsessed with Pinterest. <laughs> and I was. Re- I do. I look at all sorts on there. It's like my go-to when I need to relax. And one day these death masks came up, and so I clicked on them, and and I was fascinated with them. And I thought, oh, that would make a great story. So. Morgan Brooks gets a box in the post at the police station and when she opens it up, it contains a death mask, but she doesn't know it's a death mask. So It's amazing when you do what just triggers a response in your mind. You think, oh, yeah, that could make a good story and it goes from there. It is. I think it was Mary Queen of Scots death mask and I was looking at it and I was just like, wow, I could do could do something with that. So <laughs> Now, as you mentioned, this is number nine in the series. Do we have to read books one to eight before we read hold your breath or can we just jump in no you should be able to just jump in we try i try and write them and my editor always tries to make sure that they could be read as a standalone obviously because it's book nine you would probably would want to i don't know some people would like to start at the beginning but if they did the first book's free (laughs) at the moment (laughs) just just get that in just so you can get a free book but no, you should be able to read it on its own. I've had people who, who've messaged and said, oh, I've picked up this book and it's number six or seven. I didn't realise it was a series, but I'm going to go back and read them from the beginning. Yes, because you are primarily an ebook author, I think it's fair to say. And as a podcast, I've been focusing more yeah. and more on that at the moment because, you know, it's a huge area and there's so many fantastic authors that you might not find if you go into a high street bookshop but authors are producing lots of books that have very high ratings and reviews. Yeah, it's it's amazing. My very first book, um, gosh, how many years ago? Was that 10 years ago now when that came out? That was lucky enough. I was a digital first author with HarperCollins and the, that did so well. They brought it out in paperback, so that went into WH Smith, so that was really nice. But um, now I think readers just like to a lot of books and they want to read them fast if they like a series so ebooks are absolutely brilliant for hitting that market and the a lot of your books are on kindle unlimited as well so people can really once they get into helen pfeiffer and your books you know they there's a whole treasure chest of books there to to get hold of <laughs> there, there is yeah that's a good way of looking at it yeah they can if they if they pay for kind if, if they subscribe to it sorry i'm stuttering um it is great because they can go back and read the rest yeah so these books as you mentioned feature detective morgan brooks can you tell us a little bit about her oh she's she's brilliant she's she got thrown in at the deep end in the first book she would just become a response officer out on independent patrol and she come across a murder and then she got because CID were short staffed she got dragged in to help with the investigation and it's all sort of stemmed from there so she's a little bit feisty she was very inexperienced uh, very unsure of herself she likes her tattoos she's quite gothic 
she managed to hold her own in CID considering she didn't know, she didn't believe she could do it, but she did and she she solved the first case. So then she got took on to be a full-time detective. She's just sort of grown from there, really. She's a lot more confident now. Now she's a bit, <laughs> a bit argumentative and telling them all what to do. She's not as scared anymore, bless her. <laughs> Is she a character you're very close to? Uh, yeah, I absolutely love her. I just think she's just so... She's very real, Morgan. She's like, she could be anybody. She could probably be one of my daughters, actually, because they're all quite feisty. <laughs> <laughs> and so what made you start to write her? How did she present herself to you? It's really strange because uh, I've wrote quite a few series. So I've wrote about a forensic pathologist who was an older lady, more my age, Beth Adams. And then Annie Graham was in her early 30s. That's my first series. And then I thought... I was going to try writing a younger character and then it came, It happened during lockdown, the first lockdown, and I was just, I just thought, what's? I wanted to do something a little bit different, a character mm. I hadn't sort of come across, so that's how she sort of came about. Oh, wonderful. And so it sounds like you're writing a lot of books. You know, if you just started that series in lockdown, how many books are you doing a year? Uh, it's been absolutely crazy. I think it's been about four a year. Four a year? Wow. Yeah, because I'm just, I'm on book 10, no, book 10's out, sorry, next, no, that's, I'm writing book 10 now, that's book 9. <laughs> I'm terrible, I need an assistant to remind me what I'm doing, it's just, such, that's the that's downfall of, of being so productive, you do get a little bit uh, lost. <laughs> And confused. So what's your writing day like? I mean, do you get any sleep? Have they got you wired up to a keyboard every minute of the day? <laughs> to be honest, no, I don't get a lot of sleep because I've got a severely disabled son, bless him. Uh, he's 28 now and he's never slept a lot. So when he's up through the night, I do sometimes do quite a bit of writing then. Or if he wakes up really early, oh, I'll, I'll do writing then. Yeah, it's just, it is really mad. I just, but what I do is I don't tend to set myself any strict limits I just try and do write every day and when I get a spare five or ten minutes even if it's only ten minutes I'll sit and do a little bit but with the challenges you've got at home with your son as you mentioned you know for some people writing is an escape but it must be quite hard to actually escape into that mindset with what you've got going on I think I think it is it's a huge escape for me and it always has been that's why I started writing in the first place it's nice to have control over something <laughs> somebody else's world mm. and it's great because um, I can just lose myself in in Morgan's world or Annie's world and and I don't have to deal with my problems so it has been a massive help so how do you get all the police knowledge correct is that something you have experience Oh, there's a story about this. <laughs> I remember I used to work as a cleaner for my sister-in-law. She had a cleaning business and I was cleaning and I used to clean a lot of doctor's houses. And one day I'd come home and um, this particular house wasn't very nice and I really had to work hard to bring it up to scratch. And I opened the, new, the local newspaper and I seen an advertisement for police community support officers. And I thought to myself, that would be fantastic research for my books. So, because I was right in the ghost house then, and I, I wanted to make Annie, she's a policewoman, as authentic as I could, but I didn't actually know any police people. So, I applied for the job, thinking, I'm never going to get this job. So, I applied for it. It took about six months and lots of processes. And then, finally, I got this letter saying, we are pleased to tell you. <laughs> and I hadn't told anybody. I hadn't even told my husband. And he came home from work that day. And I remember showing him the letter and I said to him, hey, I've done something really stupid. And he was like, what? And I was like, I've applied for this job in the police. <laughs> and he was like, what have you done that for? And I said, well, it'll help with me writing. So... And so that's how I've got all my police knowledge, because then I've spent 15 years as a police community support officer. <laughs> oh, my goodness, that's incredible. The lengths you go to. It's what you call extreme yeah. research. <laughs> so are you still working there now, or is that... No. No. Uh, mm. Thankfully, I was able to go full-time writing. So, But I did 15, 15 busy years. Uh, I mean, when I first started, I remember saying, coming home and saying to Steve, what have I done? I don't like this. I don't like it. And he was like, well, just give it a couple of months. If you don't like it, you don't have to carry on, do you? But then after six months, I kind of fell into it. And I absolutely loved it. I met some great people and made some great friends. You must have a wealth of story ideas as well from that. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, probably, yeah. But I try not to use them because um, it's just a little bit too too real to home. But So how do you manage the thrills in your book and getting the pace right so it's not too frantic, but equally we keep turning the pages? To be honest, I don't... I, I think it's all to do with me being such a voracious reader from a young age. And I think I just, because I read so much, I used to read um, when the kids were younger and go to school, I'd read about three or four books a week. I absolutely love reading. And I always have done that. And I just think I naturally <clears throat> picked it up, like how these like James Patterson, Stephen King, um, Dean Koontz, how they all wrote, I've just sort of like, I think I just sort of know how to do it because nobody's ever... I've never actually sat down and done a course on it or done anything like that. It's just... I just cut off. I just think, well, I'll leave it on a bit of a cliffhanger and go to the next chapter. <laughs> so how did you get your first book published? I mean, you mentioned about the digital first book that you had. Was that the very first yeah. book you've ever had published? It was, yeah. So that was a... They're all, they're all great tales, these... <laughs> <laughs> and it took me eight years to write that book because I didn't know, didn't have a clue what I was doing. So eight years to write and get it published. But what happened was I used to buy a writing magazine all the time. I mean, I still do buy it because I do like reading everybody's stories. But I seen there was going to be a Romantic Novelist Association conference at Penrith, which is only about an hour and a quarter from me. And nothing good ever really happens around here like that. And so I joined, I managed to join the, RNA is a new, on the new writers scheme. That was I. I asked them if they'd accept me. They said, "Do you write romance?" And I said, "Well, no, it's crime and supernatural." And they said, "Does anybody kiss?" And I went, "Yes." And she went, "Yeah, you'll be all right. You can join." <laughs> <laughs> so thankfully, they let me join, and uh, I sent my book off. And then it came back with this huge critique, and I could have cried. Well, I did cry. I think I was that shocked. I wasn't expecting that. But thankfully, it picked up everything that I needed to change it to make it better to submit to people so then I said I went to the conference and about a week before the conference they advertised that you could do a one-to-one -one with agents or publishers editors from publishing houses and I thought to myself that'd be really useful just for the experience so I, I, I emailed Jan Jones who arranged it all back then and I asked her was there any slots left for that I could speak to somebody? So she, she fit me in with a wonderful editor called Anna Bagley from... It was Harlequin back then. So I went from a one-to-one -one with Anna and she just laughed and she said, what are you doing here? She went, I read this on the train down and I thought, this isn't romance. <laughs> <laughs> she said, but I loved it. She said it was so... Um, it's just not what I was expecting. So she said I could send her off the first three chapters... Was it the first three chapters? Yeah, so I sent her the first three chapters off and then she asked for the full book and she, bless her, she was so amazing. She worked so hard with me. I think we had to. I had to rewrite the book, the whole book, about three times before she said it was good enough to take it to the buying team. Then she took it to the buying team and then they bought it and offered me a two-book contract. So it was just... I think for me it was literally being at the right place at the right time and being completely ignorant about and persevering because <laughs> I didn't have a clue yeah and persevering I was just I just knew because I had previously sent it off to agents and it had come back quicker than I sent it to be fair but that was before I got my report back from the RNA and that and I knew what I'd done wrong so wow. I was very 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 lucky that's wonderful. Yeah. So is there anything special that you do on publication day to celebrate or are you too busy writing the next 3,000 books? Now I'm, I'm too busy writing the next. Um, in the beginning, I used to, I did have a launch party for the ghost house just for my close family and friends. That was lovely. Um, I wouldn't read any of my book to them though. <laughs> get up and read I was like absolutely not I was so embarrassed I didn't even tell anybody I was writing a book until I'd been offered a contract and I knew when it was coming out I just kept it so quiet <laughs> my goodness so what funny. a story it's just fascinating to yeah. hear all of this well Helen <laughs> we come to the last question which is the crucial one on this podcast so prepare yourself what biscuit powered the writing of Hold Your Breath? What is your biscuit of choice? Ooh, I would have to say Marks and Spencer's. 
do a short bread thin and they are absolutely beautiful so and I fool myself because I'm always on a diet and I never do any good so I buy them and because I buy them for the grandkids because my grandkids love them but I tend to eat them all so it, it was fueled by those and happy hippos I've got a thing for happy hippos <laughs> oh, I do enjoy a happy hippo <laughs> Who would have thought happy hippos and shortbread things from Marks and Spencers? Whatever works. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, it's just been wonderful to talk to you and hear more about Hold Your Breath and all your incredible books. Helen Pfeiffer, thank you so very much. Oh, thank you so much, Philippa. It's been a pleasure. I just think it's so interesting hearing about different authors and different approaches. My goodness, Helen has such a career, so, so many books behind her that are all so well rated. And I just, I do think it's interesting. I am far too judgy about books that, or I have been in the past far too judgy about books that have, are not sort of printed first, that are ebook first. And I am really learning that that was entirely the wrong approach and that I have missed out on this wealth of other writing that's there on ebooks. So, yes, we're going to keep going with these with these ebooks. I think it's very interesting. Anyway, let's talk about the next book. And this is 30 Days of Darkness by Jenny Lund Madsen. What a book this was. Let me read you the blurb. Copenhagen author Hannah is the darling of the literary community and her novels have achieved massive critical acclaim. But nobody actually reads them. And frustrated by writer's block, Hannah has the feeling that she's doing something wrong. When she expresses her contempt for genre fiction, Hannah is publicly challenged to write a crime novel in 30 days. Scared that she will lose face, she accepts and her editor sends her to a quiet, tight-knit village in Iceland filled with colourful local characters for inspiration. But two days after her arrival, the body of a fisherman's young son is pulled from the water and what begins as a search for plot material quickly turns into a messy and dangerous investigation that threatens to uncover secrets that put everything at risk, including Hannah. Prologue. His heart was in his mouth. Why should it end here, like this? He wanted to scream, to tear himself apart, to hit someone, kick them in the head until their life ebbed away. It didn't matter if it were him, as long as it was someone who deserved it. In that moment, it felt like the whole world deserved to die. I loved this book. I thought it was brilliant. It's a debut, apparently. Uh, I'm not sure how that is because it's written beautifully. It's sort of, it's funny in a sort of twisted way. It's different. It's fresh. I thought it was very atmospheric. And I think this is going to be the start of a new series as well, which is just, you know, superb. I really enjoyed it. I enjoyed the revelations as you went along, how the plot was managed, the story. Yeah, excellent. Bravo, bravo. Very good. And now we come on to another very good book, which is called Contacts by Mark Watson. Now, let me read you the blurb of this one. James Chilton boards the 2350 sleeper train from London to Edinburgh with two pork pies, six beers and a packet of chocolate digestives. At 2355, he sends a message to all 158 people in his contacts, telling them that he plans to end his life in the morning. He then switches his phone to flight mode. He said goodbye. To him, it's the end of his story and time to crack open the biscuits. But across the world, 158 phones are lighting up with a notification – Phones belonging to his mum, his sister, his ex-best friend, the woman who broke his heart, people he's lost touch with, people he barely knows. And for them, the message is only the beginning of the journey. And let us let me do the first few sentences of this because, I yes, I need to tell you about this book. And obviously, this book, I should say, all sort of trigger warnings for suicide. So you get, know that. But it's, yeah, anyway, let me do the first few sentences. Chapter 1, 8th of March 2019, 23.55. I've decided to end my life. I know this will come as a shock to some of you and I'm sorry if it upsets anyone. Sorry also if a text message is a strange way to find out. I'm not sending this for you to try and change my mind. I know what I'm doing and I'm fine. I just wanted the chance to say goodbye and to thank you for the things we have shared. James. Kiss. I listened to this book on audiobook. I loved it. I loved it so much. It could be in my one of my top books for this year. I mean, I have to say, the way Mark Watson narrates it adds even more. He, I love his voice, his delivery. 
And because he knows the humour in the book, you know, he delivers it at the at the right way. And that, that's what I wanted to say, even though there are trigger warnings, obviously, about suicide in this, there is a lot more to it. It is about life, it is about death, but it's about connection. And I thought it was tremendous. I was sorry when it had finished. It made me want to listen to more of Mark's books. I thought it was well written, well narrated. I just thought it was exceptional. Really, really good. I really recommend it. It's excellent. And the last one is The Premonitions Bureau by Sam Knight. Now, let me tell you about this book before I then tell you what Philippa did. Right, so let me read you the blurb of this book. Premonitions are impossible, but they come true all the time. You think of a forgotten friend, out of the blue they call. But what if you knew that something terrible was going to happen? A sudden flash, the word Charing Cross. Four days later, a packed express train comes off the rails outside the station. What if you could share your vision and stop that train? Could these forebodings help the world to prevent disasters? In 1966, John Barker, a dynamic psychiatrist working in an outdated British mental hospital, established the Premonitions Bureau to investigate these questions. He would find a network of hundreds of correspondents, from bank clerks to ballet teachers. Among them were two unnervingly gifted percipients. Together, the pair predicted plane crashes, assassinations and international incidents with uncanny accuracy. And then they informed Barker of their most disturbing premonition, that he was about to die. And let's go. Chapter one. The music school was in an ordinary terraced house on one of the main roads leading out of London to the north. The front was pebble dash like its neighbour. There were lace curtains and neat cared for roses growing under the bay windows. A curved archway of red bricks framed the front door, to the left of which hung a black sign with gold lettering in confidently varying fonts. Miss Lorna Middleton, teacher of pianoforte and ballet dancing. Now, what I should have done. Now, I got this as an audio book in my defence, so the writing was small. I saw the title, I'd heard about the book before, and I think it was on like a two-for-one deal or a special, so I just, I just got it. What I didn't realise is that in little letters, certainly on the audio book, it says, a true story. And I thought this was some sort of dystopian book. And I was listening to the story, getting into it, and I thought, it's very specific. There's a lot of detail being given for something that is a fiction book. And it went on. And yeah, I was a few hours into this. I was like, this is really very intense on the old facts and details. And it was that point I had a little Google and discovered that actually this is a non-fiction book. Yes, Philippa got it wrong. So did I enjoy it? I I was disappointed, but that is entirely, entirely my fault. It's well written. It's well described. There's the interesting stories. I did keep listening to it because I wanted to hear how it developed. But is it one that I'm going to say, oh, wow, amazing? No, I'm not. But that is entirely my fault because I got it in my mind that it was one thing and it was another. So that is more fool me. It, if you're looking for something non-fiction, I would really recommend it as something to listen to if it sounds interesting. Otherwise, if you're looking for fiction, then, uh, yes, avoid Philippa's silly mistake. So there we are. There's a, another week of Philippa being angry and silly and full of germs. What else may happen next? I don't know. So I'm going to just remind you of the books that we've covered today. We have had. We've had The Other Mothers by Catherine Faulkner. Hold Your Breath by Helen Pfeiffer. 30 Days of Darkness by Jenny Lund Madsen, Contacts by Mark Watson and The Premonitions Bureau by Sam Knight. That's it. We're done. There'll be another quick short episode on Friday. Otherwise, I'll see you back here on Monday and hopefully by then I will have calmed down. Anyway, just look after yourselves, please. There's a lot for us all to deal with at the moment. I hope you're doing OK. Just... Keep going one foot in front of the other, one book in front of the other, and we'll get there. So just look after yourselves, and I'll see you very soon. Take care now. Bye-bye. You've been listening to the Quick Book Reviews podcast. That's enough books, said no one, ever. See you again soon.